So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the first Open Access 2016 week event for the official Open Access Week. Uh, this is our first year of a joint event between Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Pittsburgh, and Duquesne University. Uh, we decided to jump the gun early this year. This is actually our second Open Access Week event. Our last event was last week, um, marking off our, our, our schedule for, of this year. Tonight's event is supporting open publishing, the article processing charge funds of Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh. My name is David Shear. I'm the scholarly repository manager and research uh, curation consultant here at CMU. Uh, joining me, I have uh, my counter colleague at the University of Pittsburgh University Library System, Lauren Collister, as well as faculty from CMU and the University of Pittsburgh joining us this evening to talk about the APC funds of these two universities. So very quickly, we have a few slides that will go over a few concepts about what are article processing charges, what are the open access funds that are set in place to pay for these things at these two institutions, and then we'll have some questions to ask our panelists that are both recipients of funds from our two article processing charge funds. So to begin, what are article processing charges? Well, an article processing charge, better known as an APC, is the cost paid by an author, the author's institution, or a um, uh, funding source to cover the journal's operation costs so that it can publish an article uh, in a peer-reviewed journal as an open access article upon publication. Uh, what this means then is that the user, the reader, does not have to pay a subscription then to have access to these articles. These articles are made openly available through these article processing charges. So to cover these costs, uh, institutions like CMU and, and Pittsburgh have set up article processing charge funds. So the APC funds are open access funds, pools of money set aside by the institutions uh, or other research sponsoring organizations at the institution to help defray or cover the cost of either some or partial or all of the cost of the APCs. Uh, while different institutions have different requirements for their various uh, applications, the overall uh, reasons for using the fund and justification is that the articles are gonna be published in an open access journal. Uh, they are known, that their policies are public and freely available so that uh, the author as well as then the reader knows when the articles are gonna be made open access and what the charges are up front prior to publication so that once the article has gone through the peer review process, um, has been accepted by the journal for publication, uh, there's no uh, surprise costs brought in at the end. The costs are very much uh, black and white. And all this is to help to share a common goal of researchers making research more freely available globally uh, for the public good. So the article processing charge fund at Carnegie Mellon University has a couple requirements. Uh, first off, it's open to all graduate students and faculty. Uh, so any graduate student faculty at the university could access and apply uh, to use the fund. As far as the journals go that are acceptable journals that can be um, published with the fund, uh, the journals again have to be made um, open access. Uh, we ask that they are listed either in the directory of open access journals, the DOAJ, or the publisher is a member of the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association or OLASPA. Once it meets our requirements, uh, as I've mentioned that we at CMU have a, a cap on how much each application can cover. Uh, at CMU, the um, APC fund will cover an article up to 80% of the APC or no more than $1,500 per article. And then each applicant is eligible for up to $3,000 worth of funding each financial year. And then the other 20% uh, the remaining amount of the APC uh, is designated to be covered either by the funded author, the funding author's uh, department or school or uh, discretionary funds or the grant uh, that it may be a part of. Then the last requirement is that once the article has been published and made uh, openly available, a copy of the article must be deposited and made available through our institutional repository research showcase. And here on the bottom of the slide, you can see where you can find our open access fund. The application is right there on the page. Uh, so please take a look. Along with having access to the fund and having this pool of money set aside for APCs, 
the university libraries also has a number of discounts that one can utilize to cover the cost of an APC, lowering the cost of that APC prior to it coming to the fund with various memberships and subscriptions that the libraries have. So there are a number of publishers that based upon our library subscription, we receive a discount. Sometimes it's up to 25%, uh, 15%, 10%. Each publishing house, it varies, as well as it will vary also if the author in question has a relationship to that publisher. So whether they've been a past peer reviewer, they've edited an article in the past for that, that particular journal, or if they're an individual member as well. And you can look at our APC discount page to look at a number of different discounts that are eligible uh, for CMU authors. Another means that the University Libraries provides um, open access publishing support is through our membership to PeerJ. So PeerJ is a open access publisher that operates off a different type of gold open access model where an author has the option of selecting one of two levels of membership to PeerJ. And what those memberships equal is either at the lowest level, you're able to publish one article a year in a PeerJ journal, and then the top tier, which is being able to publish two articles per year in a PeerJ journal. Uh, the membership actually is covered by the North City Libraries. We have a separate fund as a part of our APC fund that covers the cost of the PeerJ membership for our authors. And predominantly what we do is if somebody applies to uh, become a PeerJ author, the libraries will actually cover the full cost because it's, it's a minor difference between the two for us to cover. Uh, once the membership fee has been paid, uh, that membership status re retains with the author for life. So even once they leave CMU, they're able to publish uh, with the Peer J at either membership, whatever was covered uh, in the initial uh, coverage. Uh, so it's, we've had a lot of success with this and we have a number of authors that have published with Peer J uh, and it's another option that we have through our APC fund. Just to give you an idea about our APC fund here at CMU, uh, we have actually have been covering the cost of APCs for authors all the way back uh, starting in 2012. Uh, our colleague actually here on the panel from CMU is actually the initial inaugural recipient of an APC charge fund. <laughs> so we'll get to talk more about that here in a minute. But since 2012, the University Library's APC fund has covered 54 articles coming from 43 unique authors that have applied for um, funding, uh, representing 17 of our academic departments, research centers and institutes, as well as uh, 30 academic journals and 18 different publishers. Just to give you an idea of what that means in one year, uh, just this year alone, so we're talking this past 2015-2016 fiscal year, we had 21 approved APCs coming from 19 unique authors, 11 unique departments, 13 journals, and 11 publishers. In that fiscal year alone, the University Library's APC fund funded over $34,000 worth of APC charges. I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Lauren Coster, to talk about the APC fund at the University Library System at Pittsburgh. Thanks, Dave. It's a little bit of a maze back here. So at the University of Pittsburgh, we have what we call the Author Fee Fund. It's Author Fee is a synonym for our processing charge. And we have very similar requirements as CMU. So one example of how we are similar is we require that any journal to be eligible must be listed in the Directory of Open Access Journals or the publisher or member of OASPA, the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association. And we require that they have a publicly available fee schedule so that we know going into it how much is going to be charged and exactly for what and what is available for different kinds of authors. We also do not fund any hybrid open access journals. And these are journals that charge a subscription fee but allow authors to pay a certain amount to make their particular article open access. And we view this as a sort of double dipping by the publishers, where they're getting both subscription fees and these open access single article charges. And we do not want to support that. We want to support fully open access work. For eligible authors at the University of Pittsburgh, we serve uh, with our fund 
authors who are served by the U university library system and the Barco Law Library. And they can be faculty, staff, or student status at Pitt. Most of our fund has been taken advantage of by faculty, but we have had some graduate students take advantage of that as well. And at the bottom of the screen here, you can see the URL. I also, on our swag table over there, have some brochures so you don't have to remember that long URL. Help you find that on our website if you're interested in checking it out. So in terms of our funds available, we do have an institutional account for Biomed Central, which allows authors to use a code to get their article processing charge or their author fee paid for. But we will fund other publishers as long as they meet our requirements. And uh, authors do apply, and they tell us what <coughs> article it is, what journal it's going to be in, give us a link to the page. And anybody who has their uh, application approved gets their entire fee covered. And that is slightly different from CMU's system. Um, we do cover the entire fee. However, this, this, uh, both systems have their benefits and their drawbacks. So there's a limitation. So for us, we have a cap on our fund of $30,000 per fiscal year. And applications are approved on a first come, first serve basis. So the uh, practical upswing of that is that the fund for 2016 to 2017 has actually already been exhausted. Believe that or not. So many people have taken advantage of it and we've funded a lot of different articles and there's enough interest that it has been used this much. So we're currently exploring some uh, other options for the future. And if you want to see what kind of information that uh, applicants have to submit, here's a link to our application right here. Just a little bit by the numbers for us. We have some numbers here from the last uh, year. This would be the 25th, or this is the 2016 um, information. So this is for the current year that has already been reached. So we have funded a total of 24 articles. Or no, we've, so, sorry, we have funded a total of 16 articles. And you can see the breakdown by school here. Um, you can see the School of Engineering is eight, and our representative here from the School of Engineering is uh, is one of those that we fund a lot. We like him, he's a frequent flyer. But we do have, what is I think is really interesting about this year in particular is that you can see the orange uh, part of the pie there is our Johnstown campus of the University of Pittsburgh. So that's one of our regional campuses. And we do fund people from our regional campuses as long as they meet our, our requirements. And this is from the Johnstown Arts and Sciences School. So we're funding all the way across the state. And our average cost of a funded article for this past year was $1,338, which I think is really interesting because that is strikingly close to the maximum amount that CMU will fund, which is $1,500, which I think we're getting the same kind of averages from both sides. So that's a little bit about our fund. I want to say that we also support other kinds of publishing models. So notably, the Open Library of Humanities is one that we support. This journal. It's actually a mega journal with several sub journals underneath it in the domain of the humanities. Um, it's free for everybody to read and reuse and there are no article processing charges. It's supported by libraries worldwide so we pay uh, what is a sort of support fee for the Open Library of Humanities. It's much less than the subscription costs and the result is that all of the articles are free for everybody so it does the world a lot of good. I, Full disclosure, I'm actually a published author in the Open Library of Humanities, so it's a really good experience if anybody wants to know more about uh, publishing with them. And we also um, support Scope 3, so the Sponsoring Consortium for Open Access Publishing and Particle Physics. It's an interesting project um, where they try to flip uh, journals in particle physics from subscription to open access, and we support that endeavor as well. So these are just a couple of other publishing models beyond the APC that we support. And we heard about another one, Pure J, earlier. So there are several different kinds of models out there in addition to APCs. So with that in mind, do you want me to introduce our panel? Yeah, Since I'm standing up here, might as well. So we have a couple of faculty members from each of our institutions who have used our fund. So from Carnegie Mellon, we have Professor David Cresswell, who is from the Department of Psychology. And from the University of Pittsburgh, Professor Irvin Sedgick who is from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Bioengineering, and Biomedical Informatics. And he has used our fund, I think, since its inception. And we have several questions for our panelists, but we'll also open it up to the audience. So if you have any questions about
these funds or about experience using these funds or article processing charges or any kind of uh, thing related to that, we're happy to take them for the panel. So do you want me to? Yeah, I'm going to pass the mic to just a member of the audience. So do you want to ask the question? So, gentlemen, thank you again for joining us this evening. Uh, the first question I have for you is, uh, can you tell us a bit about the article or articles that you've published using the APC funds? Uh, and Irvin, if you'd like to start off. So, uh, I guess my first experience was uh, 2012, when the f I just initially joined Pitt. And I actually came from Canada to the U.S., so uh, some of the uh, Canadian schools actually have joined funds uh, to enable uh, faculty members and graduate students to publish in open access journals. And for many Canadian institutions, is actually, well, at that time, so early 2010s and early 2000s, uh, they were encouraging authors to, especially in some of the engineering uh, fields, to publish in these open access journals for one particular reason. They would kind of give us a faster response to initial submission. Uh, as you may have known that some of the engineering journals were notoriously notoriously slow when it comes to decision making. I had articles that were on, you know, in under review for about two years. So it's uh, uh, when open access journals came out, it was a great way for us to speed up some of the publishing process because by the time your article comes out, it was also already obsolete because it's stuff you did three years ago. So that's how I started, it became involved in uh, open access and especially for us, I'm a, on a brink of engineering and medicine, so for uh, it's not medically enough to be published in medical journals which tend to have fast turn kind of turnover rate, but it's not purely engineering to be published in the old. So these open access provided kind of a new ven venue for us to publish our contributions. Yeah, so, uh Again, I'm David Cresswell. I'm in psychology here. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think I've had two papers with you guys. Three. Three. Okay. Jeez, I don't remember the third one. Um, so uh, the two that I'm thinking of were in the PLOS journals, the Public Library of Science, which is a you know popular outfit for many of us and across many domains. Um, and uh, for those who are not familiar with the process of getting funds, at least here at CMU, I would say it's about a five-minute uh, online template that you have to fill out. I mean, it's a very quick process, and um, usually within 48 or so hours, at least that's what it was for these last couple, uh, I get a really nice email back saying, sure, we're willing to you know, cover part of the cost. So it's a very easy process. Um, and it's, um, you know, the APC has been really instrumental in um, helping defray some of the costs of um, some of the undergraduate honors theses to come out of my lab. So some really motivated, bright undergraduates did some, some wonderful work. And uh, you know we got it published, and we didn't really have funds to cover, cover this. So that was a really um, helpful way for us. So although they say it's for graduate students and faculty, I mean, I think that if the faculty member is the sponsoring you know, um, uh, you know, PI for the work, they're happy to fund it. But it's been a great way to really get the work out there, and uh, it was a very easy process. Uh, in all cases. So Irvin, you mentioned a bit about uh, your interest was in looking at the open access uh, publishing model. So I guess for both of you, uh, what interests you about publishing in an open access journal that would make the articles openly available? You know, what, what seemed appealing to you about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the bottom line for, for us as scientists when we publish our work is to make an impact. And, you know, one of the ways that's measured is whether people are citing your work. And I don't know if people have done the, you know, quantitative studies, but it's certainly from my, my perspective, you get your, uh, your citation counts up much faster with these, uh, with these open access journals. Um, they get the work out to a much broader audience much faster typically than our, uh, our usual uh, journals. So, you know, I think in 20 years we're all gonna look back on, like, do you remember that time we were sitting at CMU in that meeting talking about, you know, open access when I think it's gonna become our dominant model. I mean, I just think it's a much, much better model. You were sort of speaking to, um, you know, a, a three year turnaround and with these open access journals, they really Really, I think all of them push to um, get the articles online um, even before they're, you know, fully baked, copy edited versions. So, I mean, they're really trying to get the work out quickly. 
Um, and, you know, we um, here in the U.S., you know, have access to resources and, and journal subscriptions fairly easily, but most people across the world, you know, don't have easy access to, uh, you know, journals that require subscription costs. So, you know, I've noticed I get a lot more emails from people from, you know, developing countries about our work uh, when we publish an open access journal just because that, you know, article is available for free to them. So, you know, I think it's a really good model. I'm I'm, you know, I'm seeing a proliferation of more of these types of journals. I just, it's the way it's going to be. So we need to find ways as an institution to support, um, you know, support open access publishing. So this is great. Well, yeah, it's the same kind of as I alluded before. Uh, the reason I started in open access journals, it was just faster for us to publish because we would cut down the, <laughs> to print from three years to few weeks. And I think what open access journals did, uh, not intentionally, is they forced other uh, kind of journals for fee, fee journals to start posting accepted versions of the papers online. So now most of the journals that I publish, even if they're like, you have to pay the prescription uh, for it, they actually post the accepted version online which is nice because suddenly you have the access, at least in North America, the American and Canadian institutions, you can access those uh, accepted papers online. Uh, the other, as uh, David said, it's actually helping us disseminate uh, science. Uh, I'm a strong believer that if it's a publicly funded science, it should be accessible to, by public. Um, I still don't know why we're allowing uh, these publishers to, uh, you know, be multinational corporations that publish these scientific journals, when in fact most of the publications are driven by taxpayers either in the States, Canada, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. So, and all of these institutions have to pay the hefty prescription fees, right? So, uh, in my mind, it's also kind of a uh, way to give back to the community what they paid for. Because I sometimes feel that we as a scientist are the only community that we charge for something and then we keep the results closed. Kind of unusual process, but. One other thing I was just thinking, you know, it is a new frontier, open access publishing, and we have some outlaws among us. I mean, um, many of you probably know that there's a lot of, you know, pay to play journals that are um, maybe not all that reputable. In fact, they'll sort of push through any garbage, and literally, you know, scientists have tested this by sending garbage papers to journals and getting them published. And of course, the uh, you know these quote unquote journals will charge something like a three thousand dollar you know fee to 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 publish there. You know, I think we um, need to figure out a way to kind of um, moderate this new forum, and I'm kind of concerned about that. Um, uh, and even some of our top journals, I, I sort of feel like the PLOS journals do a pretty good job. You know. Fair fees, good peer review process, but the Frontiers journals, I don't know, I have some concerns with uh, their fees are much higher and, and <laughs> their review standards are a little bizarre. But um, and in fact, Frontiers is considered to be a highly credible journal. But we, we kind of have these issues we have to, to play around with. So if you are you know, in the position of moving to the open access model, um, be um, thoughtful, I think, in sort of picking um, you know, reputable journals for the panelists. Um, and we'll take questions from the audience. If any of you have a question, just please wave at me and I'll give the microphone to you. But building off of that, as scholars, how do you evaluate a journal uh, in terms of how reputable it is? You mentioned a couple of things about the, the fee and the review. When you get you know, a paper that you want to publish, what kind of things do you look for in a reputable journal if it's open access? I know for me, if I get an unsolicited email in my inbox from somebody I've never heard of, that's an instant indicator that it's probably not reputable. But what are some other things that, that you look for? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I clearly look at um, impact factors, which sort of indicate the relative, you know, citation rates for these journals. Um, you know, we have we have some kind of main players in the open access movement, um, and uh, you know, you sort of look for um, reputable groups of people that are driving the editorial boards of those um, uh, those journals. I, each year, there's new ones that come out. You know, Sage has a new um, what do they call it? Sage Open. 
that's been getting a lot of buzz and um, what is it e life um, you know all and, and these are um, you know they don't quite have impact factors yet because they're pretty new but you know you look at the editorial boards and you're saying hey these are colleagues that I really you know value their 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 guidance so you know it's sort of a mix of factors um, for those of us that are more junior you know you have to be sensitive to um, you know, is your department going <laughs> to value this? So there's kind of a bit of, you know, talking to colleagues in your field and in your department about whether this is going to be a, a, an outlet that's, that's suitable for helping your promotion case. But, um, you know, those are sort of factors that I think about. Uh, similarly, I look at the publishers. For example, nowadays you even have Nature has its own open access journal, scientific reports. Uh, science has one, Science Advances, right, or whatever it's called. Uh, IEEE, one of the largest electrical engineering publishers, they also have a open access journal, which I just published in. Thank you very much for approving. <laughs> uh, so looking at the impact factors, looking at the publishers, the track of the uh, Public Library of Science has most of their journal, all of their journals are, they go, you get the rigorous time, uh, peer review process going on. Uh, but as David alluded, there are some predatory journals and predatory schemes uh, that tend to, so we have to sometimes sift through the noise and make sure that it, uh, it is actually a legit open access journal. Uh, Sheila Coral, uh, University of Pittsburgh, um, <clears throat> uh, in School of Information Sciences. I just wanted to add to, to your, your comments about the predatory publishers that I think that um, graduate students and junior faculty are particularly vulnerable to these publishers because they're often, you know, really keen, especially PhD students, they're just finishing up, they're really keen to get some things on their CV and very tempted by this. And some of them are totally unscrupulous. I mean, they just make up impact factors and sort of claim that they have, you know, certain uh, metrics which are completely untrue. And they also often put names on the editorial boards without people even knowing that. So I think it's really important that, um, you know, those of us in more senior positions um, adv advise our, you know, colleagues and, and students to you know, contact the library if they're, they're being approached by a journal they've, 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 they're not familiar with or they haven't seen their, <clears throat> their advisor publishing in, for example, because I think the library can do a good job in sort of sussing out some of these rogue publishers. You know, both of you kind of indicated that you look at who are on the editorial board, you know, what is the impact factor, what are the costs. I, I wonder if you've looked at any of the other uh, publication lists like uh, the Directory of Open Access Journals, because the, the, the comment from the audience is very uh, important because that list is something that is, is looked by a third party. Um, to give full disclosure, I'm a managing editor of the DOAJ, uh, and I oversee a team of, of editors that review all that information about each journal and the publishers that supply that to ensure that, just as we pointed out, that if they supply information about what their practices are, is that uh, they are actually practicing those practices. So I, the question is, do you look at other list of publications or other uh, ways to find open access journals in your disciplines to see if they are open access or potential journals to, to publish with? So I tend to also look at the Thomson Reuters uh, impact factor list. Uh, uh, your, the DOAJ, whatever it's called, I keep forgetting, I always Google it. Uh, I do look for alternative sources uh, just to make sure. And I, again, uh, looking where some of my colleagues publish, if they publish in open access, what are the journals? Uh, most of my senior colleagues, if they uh, decide to publish in open journal, uh, open access journals, they actually know what they're doing. So I'm trying to follow their footsteps rather than picking up some obscure uh, new journal. Uh, in my Maybe I'm less known than anybody else, but I rarely get uh, editors emailing me and soliciting my articles. So <laughs> that's the first kind of uh, red flag for me that uh, 
because most of the invited articles that I had, I knew people very well. So, <laughs> uh, so that that's a red flag for me. If somebody sends me and starts the email with the Dean Dr. Sadich, then I know that it's a, probably a red flag. <coughs> but in general, yeah, it's always kind of a a combination of a few different so resources and sources to say. Yeah, I don't have any. I don't have any systematic strategy here. I'm sort of hearing you say that, and I'm like, yeah, that wouldn't hurt to <laughs> cross list the uh, the journals that we're targeting with, you know, lists of you know regulatory groups that you know try to police these things. I mean, we've been fairly uh, careful about picking journals that we know are very reputable journals, um, open access journals, and trying to go with those. Um, so we haven't moved down the list of, you know, what would be probably considered to be more of these, you know, lower impact journals that that may may or may not be credible. So since both of you were kind of early adopters of the fund, um, I, I wondered if you could speak about your experiences prior to having access to the APC fund. Um, if the funds didn't exist and we didn't, neither institution had an APC fund, um, how else would you get the costs covered for these APCs? Could you get it covered? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'd probably beg my department head to pay, um, you know, sort of saying these are undergraduates that, you know, want to get their work out there and, you know, trying to, to hustle some money together. So, you know, the APC has been a huge uh, resource for us. And, um, you know, I've been a proponent of it in our faculty meetings saying that folks should use it. I mean, it's... It's a, it's a sweet, sweet deal. Um, and from a university perspective, you know, it's I think a really important um, way that we can support more open access publishing and starting to, uh, you know, shift the, the tide away from subscription models where, you know, you have to pay, a, I don't know how much we pay for journals, but it's gotta be pretty expensive from an institutional standpoint. Um, <laughs> what's that? It, it's 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 got to be a staggering amount, and you know um, I don't know if anyone's read. I think wasn't there an Atlantic article that came out on El Sevier as a publishing model and how they they pocket like millions of dollars every year, um, publishing our you know our research that is publicly funded. So you know I mean they're like it's like a total scam. Um, wait, is this being recorded? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, I mean, uh, the, there's, and not to down, downplay the fact that, you know, the, the editing process and managing journals is, you know, something that's going to require funds to support. But, you know, making millions and billions of dollars um, in a for-profit model doesn't seem right, you know, if this is publicly funded research um, that we want to make available to folks to ultimately improve the health and, you know, well-being of of our society, so you know, I, I guess I I feel like we need to do everything in our power to to try to to to, to shift this away from the subscription models. More of a comment. Um, I'm Tim Delianidis. I'm director of the Office of Scholarly Publishing, Scholarly Communication and Publishing at Pitt, um, and my colleague Lauren didn't mention one of the strategies that we're using to support new models for publishing, and that is being a publisher. We publish 40 scholarly peer-reviewed journals, and what we're trying to do is um, provide uh, that quality peer review um, process, and then openly share the results worldwide um, through open access, but do it in a way that doesn't require a 40% profit margin that a company like Elsevier collects every year. So we do it um, using technology and elbow grease and some volunteer labor, but um, working in a way that's, that's um, more cost effective for the whole ecosystem. So hmm. that's one thing that, um, that I think libraries could, could do much more of. And, and contribute to a change in this whole whole model. And I wanted to also make a plug for OASPA that, that I think both Lauren and David mentioned, um, which is the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. And that's a trade association that does police 
um, this area of predatory publishers and helps maintain quality for, for all of us. So um, it's also an organization that's very supportive of open access publishing, but at the same time um, uh, looking, looking out for um, the integrity of the publishers that, that use the name open access. So. Hmm. So both of you have talked about your experiences with working with um, traditional publishers and, and, and working with open access publishers. Um, could you talk a bit about the differences that you saw, or if any differences really existed, uh, about publishing with one versus the other? And what would you say to authors that are considering um, having an open access article that have said that, well, articles published in, in open access journals are, are of less quality, or they don't do as much work as the traditional publishers. Uh, what would you say to that? I would actually as strongly argue against it, because uh, if you consider that Nature has open access journal, and we, it's fairly difficult to get into uh, that journal. So uh, I don't foresee why an open access would be any less stringent than the subscription-based journal because at the end both are there to make profit. It's just with an open access you pay up front rather than hiding the costs somewhere in the library. Um, in both scenarios you actually have volunteer peer reviews and again given that most of the difficult work is done by volunteers in both cases I still don't understand why we have these subscription-based journals because they make a profit out of everybody else's work. Uh, so I don't, I think uh, that was a bit of a, a law being done by the, some of these publishing houses that the, when the open access movement started, they wanted to kind of scare people away and you know how academics tend to be scared easily. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in my mind, I actually got, uh, sometimes more uh, stricter reviews with open access rather than traditional journals. So uh, again, the quality of journal uh, is always the same. If it's a good, quali uh, good journal, it's a good journal. If it's a bad journal that publishes garbage in, garbage out, it's a bad journal. It doesn't matter whether it's a traditional based journal or it's a new open access journal, at least in my mind. Yeah, I mean, you know, with any journal process, after you submit a paper and it's accepted, you want a very efficient, streamlined copy editing process where they're getting the page proofs to you back, um, you know, in a couple of weeks max, and that they're very receptive to, you know, turning that around and getting it back out again. And, you know, I've had no, with the PLOS journals, I've had no no issues whatsoever. Um, you know, they've done a very good job. Um, and so I see no difference in terms of the kind of post acceptance process to, you know, getting the, the proofs out um, compared to um, subscription based journals. So that's certainly a myth. I, I agree completely with what you said. based on something you guys have said, both of you, about, so David, you said that you have no idea um, how much libraries pay for subscriptions for journals, but it's got to be a lot. It is a lot. Um, and Irvin, you said that, you know, you pay the cost up front rather than hiding it in the library. So after having your experience with publishing open access and seeing these article processing charges, are you more aware of the cost of publishing than you were before? Did you ever, before you had to deal with APCs, did you ever think about how much a journal would cost to access or to publish in? Well, I had a uh, kind of an idea as a graduate student because there were discussion at least at some of the Canadian universities about the access to all of the journals because uh, Canadian universities actually pulled their money and pay one giant fee to different publishers. So. And there was a question, do we have to really have to have the access to every possible journal there is, or we can cut down the number of journals and decrease some of the fees. So I was uh, aware of the multi-million dollar schema <laughs> that was going on at the time. Uh, so with an open access, I think it's becoming fairer. I do understand that these are 
companies, they have to make profit, they have to pay their workers, so uh, they, you have to pay for it. But I think uh, the fact that it's an open uh, access, so anybody can access the published work, which was paid by the taxpayers, I think that's a big plus for me. Uh, again, I, I still don't understand why traditional journals are not already open access because we anyway, we don't pay the per article uh, subscription fee, but we pay one giant lump when it probably when you average it out, it comes very close to that 1300 uh, that we already pay for these. So. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the writing's on the wall in that every major, even the subscription-based journals are now offering open access lines so you can pay once you get, um, you know, your article accepted there to have it be open access on that journal. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just a matter of time, I think, before this becomes the, the gold standard. And it's going to be interesting to see how that changes the, the publishing landscape for these subscription-based journals because I think they're sort of seeing that they're going to lose this over time. I really hold that in, you know, 10 to 20 years, we're going to look back on this and be like, I can't believe we had a meeting about, you know, APCs and open access journals because it will be the, you know, it will be the, the model. David, to kind of build off of your comments, um, since we know that not all journals that a researcher and a faculty member may be publishing may be an open access journal, ha has publishing in an open access journal and using the APC funds uh, made you rethink about your other scholarship? Uh, since both funds dictate that you can't use the fund for a hybrid journal, so a journal that can be made open without having to pay an APC, um, have you thought about your other scholarship and maybe practiced more uh, green open access models, so making um, a version of that other work available? Have either of you done had that experience? What do you mean by other work? So other articles that are published uh, but not in an open access journal. So maybe another traditional journal uh, that operates with the subscription fees that doesn't have an open access model. Have you thought about making that work open, you know, as another means? I don't know if we can say this on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Should, should we discuss this? Yeah. Being I, I, I'll, I, uh, I'll, I'll add, the, add the caveat through your institutional repository of yeah. your institutions. Yeah. So uh, so two comments about the institutional repository. Well, first. To be totally open about my practices, I post all of my articles as PDFs on my website, and I have the standard, I think, disclaimer language that may or may not be legal, but I don't care. I'll just go to jail if someone really wants to press me on this um, because I really do feel like this work is important to get out to a, a broader audience. Um, so um, that's the policy I put into place. Now, I'll probably get a call from legal tomorrow um, telling me to take them down. So. Um, the other option, of course, as you mentioned, is the CMU Libraries Repository, which I think is a, a great model. You know, it, it gets with the, uh, the trolling that they do for S Google Scholar, you know, it'll usually pick up the CMU um, Repository PDFs, which is great. So, you know, users then can find your articles. So that's great. Love that feature. thing I don't like about the CMU Repository is that um, it, in the past, has also put up our undergraduate honors theses, which are usually not fully baked articles. Um, and so I've had concerns about, um, you know, getting emails from colleagues saying, oh, I see you have this new paper. And I'm like, well, you know, we're, we're kind of working on that paper. It's not quite ready for prime time yet. And it's now available as a PDF online. So we need to be, I think, careful about um, when we do and don't post. I think maybe that policy might have changed. I'm not sure. Because um, I was, I, I, I raised a big stink about it. Sorry about that. But I think it was important important that we, you know, do some um, policing of what does go up onto that. So I think it's great overall. Yeah, I do the same thing as David, so uh, I might get a call tomorrow morning as well. Uh, I actually post PDFs of uh, our own versions of published uh, papers. Uh, I feel that it should go out to the uh, community and if they want to read it, they should be able to read it in some form. I'm strongly uh, supporting NIH's effort where they release all the articles after a year. Uh, so in my mind, I think we should encourage, I know there is, I do the same thing, I post this 
miscellaneous statement that I found somewhere on the some website that how this is just a preliminary draft of the things. Uh, this should be available to the community. And we should realize that um, when some of these policies have been instituted 20, 30, 40 years ago, most of this was accessed by uh, researchers in the United States and Canada, in one of the most developing countries. If you look at the, some of the reports made by, available by the White House on the artificial intelligence, deep learning, they were just released last or a couple of weeks ago when the president was here. Uh, you have more papers now coming from China than the United States on certain topics. So not being able to disseminate these uh, to such a broad uh, nation is keeping your results closed and not being actually able to communicate the newest results with the rest of the world. So I think we should encourage this uh, to make these either through the institution or some other means of making these PDFs available in either preliminary form or accepted form, who cares, but at least uh, just letting people know that, all right, well, this has been done, you know, take the next level from this, where I left off, you guys should start there, so. Judy Brink, head of the engineering library at Pitt. When I first met you, Irvin, one of your first questions to me was about the open access fee fund, which we had just talked about a month or two before, but we didn't even have that, that fund available yet. But you had come from an institution where that was the culture. And so if we are to, in 20 years, reach the point where um, most of the journals are um, open access, what is it that the library can do um, to change the culture um, in addition to paying for the APC charges? What else can we do to persuade your colleagues and, and to work with graduate students? I, I think there is a still bit of a bad rep associated with these open access journals and a, a nice outreach program might change many minds. Uh, what I found that junior uh, faculty members are more open to publishing in open access journals. Uh, I guess it's just a generation change. I know that some of my more senior colleagues are kind of staying away and thinking God knows what is going on there and that we are paying that these are articles are not peer reviewed. So that there were some discussions about what is an open access. So I think kind of an outreach program to uh, different departments uh, would be, I think, a nice way for libraries and library staff to kind of tell the other faculty what is going on. And especially in these uh, more traditional non-school of medicine departments, which may have a mix of both uh, half junior, half senior faculty, and you sometimes have junior faculty being scared of publishing in open access journals because they know that senior faculty is not supportive of those efforts. So kind of getting everybody at the same level would be great. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question what libraries can do. I think that there needs to be a five-year plan and a 10-year plan here. I think the five-year plan consists of um, getting more money into the APC. I just think that it's going to be more and more used. Um, I mean, you know, I sat down at a faculty meeting. I said, listen, the library has free money <laughs> for your publications. You know, and, uh, you know, people perked up at that. So, I mean, it's like, you know, it's a no-brainer. But that, that is something that libraries can do to support this effort around open access publishing. Because you're right, there is a barrier around, okay, how am I going to pay for this if I do go this route? And if there's an APC that's, that's flush, you know, um, people are going to, it's going to be a nudge that's going to be really valuable over the next five years. So I think that's the five-year plan. I think the 10-year plan is to expect that we're going to move to an open access model. And how are we going to support that? And I think there's going to be a tipping point where libraries have to evaluate, do I want to continue paying this subscription fee for this, for this journal, this A journal over here, or do I want to pay, you know, do I want to delegate the funds for a different A open access journal? And, you know, I think we're going to have to, you know, in the 10-year, in the 20-year plan, evaluate how we shift, 
you know, that sort of funding model for our libraries so that, you know, at some point I really do believe these guys are just going to fall off the map. We just, no one's going to be wanting to go to these subscription-based uh, journals because I think open access um, is going to be better. Now, I think science and nature will probably always be a subscription-based um, set of journals. Well, may maybe not, maybe not in 20 years. But, you know, I think there, there's a different plan for the, the, the sort of 10-year plan. But in the short term, let's provide every possible nudge for people to um, have support to publish in open access journals. And I, I mean, you guys have the access to all the numbers. Uh, for example, I would invite you to just calculate the cost per article uh, for traditional base uh, publisher like IEEE. Uh, you guys probably have the list of published articles in IEEE from Pitt faculty. You know exactly how much you pay uh, the subscription. So we can actually come up with a number and I think you'll come up with very close number. Uh, not for all publishers, but some of these publishers uh, will definitely be on that level about 1300. The problem with um, moving from the subscription basket to the open access basket, that cost per article is a moving target, and these large publishers are working very, very hard to monetize open access as fast as they can to keep their profits at the same, same level. So we're fighting against that. Um, and uh, to David, I, I would say um, that I agree with you. I'd love to see uh, these, the allocation for APC charges increase, but it's going to be a difficult decision because we will have to cut subscription-based journals to do that. We'll have to make decisions. So um, my colleagues in the university library system that that manage collections and hold the purse strings, um, uh, they've got a very difficult path to, to um, move money from one, one basket to another because it will be painful for certain portions of our population in the universities. Just to add to that, I think something that a lot of faculty are not aware of is the much more complicated subscription landscape now compared even with 10 years ago because publishers, it used to be quite simple for libraries, well relatively so, in that you know, you'd have a list of journals you subscribe to annually and you'd have a subscription charge for each individual title. Now the publishers all have them all in great bundles. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, they, they tell you you have, you have many more journals available but you don't necessarily want them all. And if they, you, know, you can start calculating the cost per journal that way, but it gives you a false figure. It's a misleading figure because you have to take the complete set of their bundle. And if you want to change that, it's not just an annual basis. You're often locked in for quite lengthy subscription periods. And so the whole thing is incredibly complicated, and that's why the, the system is moving quite slowly. And as fast as the OA movement tries to <laughs> bring about change, the publishers, as Tim was saying, are just trying to come up with new ploys to make it more difficult for everybody. But we just got to keep pushing for it. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to look at these portfolios of, you know, what subscription bundles we carry as institutions. But um, I suspect that there are some bundles that are pretty low frequency use uh, across the university, that even just cutting like one of those, for example, and relying on interlibrary loan as a way to catch people who need to get those articles, and then dumping all that money into an APC fund, you know, even just one bundle, you know, could make a huge difference. No, I don't know. I don't know how much bundles cost. They're but massive plans that include high use journals and low use journals together, mixed. And These it's publishers very calculated are smart. The way that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> very calculated. So the complicating thing is sometimes you're really not buying it. Sometimes you're just licensing it. When Rick said, oh, yeah, it's like uh, cable, yeah, it is a lot of times. You, if you license properly, you may have long-term access 
to the digital, but there are some things that we've had to license where, in fact, if we cancel it, we lose access to everything we've ever had. I mean, so th it's a brave new world out there. Yeah. One of the things that I think was going to change, I mean, with the interlibrary loans, and uh, I sometimes rely on them, but mostly for old publications. With the newer publications, I directly email authors and say, hey, can you send me a PDF? I want to reference it. And they send you 10 different PDFs <laughs> of relevant <laughs> things that you... <laughs> uh, so I think with the kind of newer journals and newer contribution, it's going to be... Um, uh, I personally have a ResearchGate account. I think it's a waste of everybody's time. But... Uh, <laughs> They are becoming quite useful in the sense that it's a. Uh, I've been the moment I publish and uh, some of these uh, subscription journals they post uh, the news that my article is published. I get a one or two requests for those uh, uh, articles right away uh, via ResearchGate. Uh, I don't like their practices of mass emailing you ten times a day uh, and telling you that your colleagues have recommended you for something. But uh, I think there is a change in the culture how some of these ac uh, articles will be accessed. And I think with more of the share of this knowledge uh, given via email or any other means, I think it's going to prompt some of these publishers to actually move away from those. Of course, it's going to take probably five to ten years. but. Well, some of the publishers aren't strictly publishers the way you think of them. So my current, the person, the, the organization I'm currently most irritated at is IEEE. <laughs> I know. Are you a member? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. So they have some of the most bizarre ways of trying to license with you. There's no basis. It's just like pick a number and that's what they charge you. I don't know if that's, you feel that's true, Judy. But I know here, I mean, essentially, they've told us, we don't charge per head. We don't charge FTE. It's a number we've come up with. I mean, honestly, that's what they've said. And that number, I'm not going to go into the messy licensing we're in right now. But, you know, if you're not here in Pittsburgh, they want us to pay another $32,000 for a handful of people that are at different programs that CMU has outside of Pittsburgh. It's just, and $32,000, I'm not sure what that per article use really comes out to, but it, you know, it's pretty expensive. So these have been some great questions and comments. Um, to kind of leave us now with our final, kind of final thoughts for the audience, um, Irvin and David, what would be your comments or recommendations to others that are, are thinking of publishing in an open access journal and thinking of using the open access funds? Well, I'm going to certainly against my colleagues against it, so I actually can use it more. Because <laughs> now that I know we are running out of funds there, I have. <laughs> so, but joking aside, I think I'm a very kind of one of the guys that advertising this service to my colleagues and I keep telling all my junior uh, colleagues, guys, there is a way if you need to publish in open access uh, journals, there is a way the university supports it, take advantage of it. Uh, the service is great for us, all the, all the interactions have been great. So I would strongly support, I know there is going to be very soon an issue of money where you're going to probably next fiscal year spend all your money in the first two months and then we'll have to wait 10 months. So I think we have to generally start at kind of uh, pushing our chairs, pushing our deans to put some money aside and contribute to the library uh, and say, hey, this is a service that we use and this is a service that we need. because. Uh, based on some of those publications, I actually applied for grants. So it's not just me publishing for the sake of publishing. So having another uh, paper, I actually use those results to get grants. So Yeah, I mean, I don't have anything else really to add except to say that people should publish in open access journals and use these funds. I think it's a, a no-brainer and it's, um, you know, a, a win for everyone. And I think we do have to be thoughtful 
particularly the the libraries have to be thoughtful moving forward about you know what is the advertising campaign. I almost feel like the better move for for libraries is to um, let the dust settle here. I think you know I think that the the groundswell is enough. Really, you, we're seeing this in the last four years where people are shifting to these open access models and these new open access journals are competing and winning. So, you know I think um, you know let's let this play out. And as a library, have plans in place for when the tipping point hits and we can say we're going to dump that whole crappy cable plan that we have uh, of those El Sevier journals. Um, and, you know, what, what is that going to mean for, for supporting folks who, who want to publish in other journals? So. Okay, great. Well, you all join me in joining, uh, thanking our panelists for this evening's conversation. Thank you all again for coming. Uh, we do have some refreshments still left over as well as some materials about both uh, our institutions. So again, thank you again. <laughs>